we'll get started. So um, my name is Greg Nudell. I'm a president and co-founder of Rev Robotics. Um, and does anybody in this room know Rev Robotics? Okay. All right, that's a good, that's a good assortment. Um, how many people in this room are from uh, the first tech challenge? Okay, and how many are from the first robotics competition? Okay, um, well that's a good assortment for this because this presentation is mostly first robotics competition related stuff. So um, I've been involved in FIRST for 21 years. I was a student on a team. I was a college mentor. I started and mentored a lot of teams over the last 21 years. I'm currently a mentor on Team 2714 Barbecue there in Texas. Um, professionally, I'm a mechanical engineer from RIT, and I have 75 plus patents. Um, products that I've made are sold all around the world. I did a lot of stuff before Rev, even though most people in this room probably know me for my Rev work as opposed to anything else. Um, product development's always been my passion, um, and so what I wanted to do with this presentation, oh, sorry, I'm out of order. Uh, Rev Robotics, since most people know, um, we were founded in 2014. Our overarching, our high-level mission statement, why we're here every day, is to make STEM accessible to students everywhere. Um, and that accessibility can come from a little bit of everything that's trying to drive prices down, that's trying to deal with shipping and logistics. Uh, Rev uh, ships products to over 180 countries around the world, which is the majority of countries around the world. And it's, our stuff's used in about over 10,000 schools globally. So accessibility is a big challenge that some of it's technical, some of it's logistics, some of it's the world and the state of the world, right? So, we're, we're driven by that. We want every student to have the opportunity, regardless of their background, where they come from, and going from there. Um, and by the way, we're always hiring engineers and interns, so this is my little plug that if um, we hire college interns in all disciplines, so check out our stuff on our website, and then engineers, come see me if you wanna work at Rev full time. So kinda let's get into this. So. I'm not sure what you thought this presentation is when you walked in the door, but I'm gonna kinda tell you what it is. Um, this is a little bit of a case study um, of the manufacturing processes that we use for SparkMax, uh, the SparkMax motor controller. This is a very, very standard process for any of our electrical products. Um, I chose this one uh, for a couple different reasons, but it's a little bit of a case study. We're gonna see a bunch of videos of different manufacturing processes. We can talk about why we chose this process over this other process um, and go from there. Um, I'll cover a little bit of trade-offs uh, associated with product design development and then some general insights in hardware development because hardware development has a little bit of a different take to it than just writing code. Um, so everybody here in this room is, is familiar with this, this word, this COTS commercial off the shelf. Um, we see that building robot parts is a way to allow teams to do more than just, when you buy something off the shelf that works, you get to focus on your idea and the integration of those parts together as opposed to reinventing the wheel from scratch, right? I mean, there's always a point in which, yes, you could take a block of aluminum and mill a wheel, mill a gear, kind of go down that road, but there is a really great off-the-shelf ecosystem of products, and that's what Rev does. That's one of the ways that we make STEM more accessible to everyone is try to have the parts for whatever teams want to build for whatever the game challenge is. Um, so I like to start with this slide, and I could probably give two or three hours of session on the uh, made in the USA versus made in China um, conversation. It is an extremely relevant conversation um, culturally, um, and as a whole, if we start talking about manufacturing, um, Rev does the majority of our manufacturing in China. We design everything here in the United States. We make most of our things in Asia, and then we distribute around the world. Um, wow, sorry, I skipped that, uh, that's fun. Okay, so I'm gonna just click that when I, when I need it. But going back to the China versus the United States thing, um, there's a lot of different logistics, there's a lot of different factors to that conversation. Um, at a very high level, the reason that we do it is we, because we ship to so many countries around the world, um, China has this really nice advantage where they can go from raw component to finished goods. Um, and there are just things that I cannot get made in the United States. So 
injection molding once you pay for the cost of the molds, not that much of a price difference, right? A lot of different processes. The biggest difference is getting all that stuff in a kit, in a spot so that we can ship to 180 countries. Logistically, the way that the supply chain of the world is made up makes China the, the place to go for that. There are concerns of different IP things. There's a lot of politics associated with that. Like I said, I could talk about that for lots and lots of hours, and I'm happy to talk questions or hang out and talk about that. That's not the purpose of this presentation, but I can't talk about the presentation without addressing that specific topic. Um, so moving on to product development, um, we there are a lot of ways to talk about product development. Again, it's that's things that you can study for semesters and years, um, and lots of companies have their own process. We are very uh, human-centric, uh, team-centric design in our product development process. So we are looking for problems. Um, we are not saying, oh, hey, we want to create this really cool thing because we think people will buy it. Um, that's not how we start our process at all. We look very closely at what products, what people are doing, what challenges exist, how do students engage. Uh, if you've ever talked to anybody at Rev in our booths or here or on the phone or customer support, part of it is always figuring out, yeah, what's wrong and what happened or how, what you're trying to do. But the other part is like looking for ways to make robotics more accessible. So we always start with what's the problem statement. Uh, it doesn't really do us any good to say, yeah, we're just gonna design the coolest motor controller of all time because if it's not really solving a problem, I can give it features that are gonna make it more expensive that, that teams won't be able to afford it, or I, we can do things that teams won't like. And so we always have to put the customer first. Um, we do a lot of really quick iteration. So one of our, one of our big tenants inside of Rev is actually um, fail faster. Right, so we can never fail fast enough because we want to take our prototypes, go as fast as you can, because the sooner it fails, the sooner we've learned more things and then we can apply that to the next generation. Um, I'm gonna show you a bunch of stuff here from design through production on this device, but there's so many more steps to this. I just wanted to kind of give you at a very high level, um, but ultimately it's understanding your customers, understanding the schedule that we've got, Build season is not going to change. Right? We we have to work around external factors, and then also cost. We are part of that accessibility that Rev always looks at is how much does it cost, right? We don't always have the the cheapest thing, but we try to figure out how to make things affordable because we know that those funds that teams spend on our products are using money that is fundraised by you, right? And I. Don't take that lightly to know that when a team buys a motor or a motor controller, that might have been a bake sale or a car wash or writing lots of grants or giving tons of presentations to companies. I don't, we don't take that for granted where those funds actually come from to buy the parts. So there's a lot of how do we make things more affordable, right? Okay, so in this presentation, I got a little bit of coverage on the original Spark, which going back to 2016, and it was in the kit for several years. Um, but we're also focusing this on the Spark Max, which we launched in the 2019, uh, 2019 season, and it was in every kit in for this past year and rookie kits in 21. Um, when I talk about goals and what we're trying to solve, the first motor controller we made for FRC, the one on the left, was really built purpose-built brush DC motor, super reliable, and really low cost, right? That was what our goal was, that's what that motor controller was. As everything evolved, we changed what our, our goals were for Spark Max, that's why there's a different product. So introducing brushless to FRC, um, really easy to configure and still trying to keep it affordable while giving teams the high-level features that you want in a motor controller. And also the reason I'm doing this case study on the Spark is that um, I know a lot of people in this room are probably very familiar with it, especially on the FRC side. Um, there's a lot of variety of manufacturing processes to touch on here from extrusion to injection molding and PCB, and there's a lot of different things there. Also, I have really good photos of this whole process. There's a lot of products that I have photos that start here and then like I'm like no documentation like photos for a slideshow until we get to a point. So I, I can walk through these a lot quicker. So I'm gonna jump back and forth between the two of these because I have some better photos on one or the other, but they the processes to build them are pretty similar. 
Also, I, I will say um, you are welcome to take photos of these slides. I, this presentation is being recorded, will be posted on, online. Um, I have no issues. I think I'm probably going to share the slide deck. I don't exactly know where it goes, but um, you can always email me and we can get you this. But this video, this will be online. So, okay. So let's start at the very top. Um, when you start a project, the thing that you're starting with is actually never close to the final project. You, you, you can set a set a scope, but just like your robot where you have to iterate on your intake or you have to build numerous revisions, we are constantly iterating all the time. That's what that fail faster thing is. Um, so if you look at the top left, it looks pretty similar, very different, a lot of iterations there. Um, most of the iterations on this type of product actually are more on the electronic side of things. Um, if you'll notice, uh, that one says Spark TNG, which the, was the original name of the Spark Max, because uh, we were thinking like little Star Trek, you know, Spark, the next generation. But, um, but anyway, so that's kind of where we, where we kind of went through, but we have to do continuous improvements up to a point, right? So we don't, once you've set your spec of what you're going to, you start working towards it, and then at some point you have to say, okay, this is the spec, this is where we're at, and then you move forward. But the more cycles of this you can do early on in your product design process, just like your robot, the better it will be as it goes. All right, so here's the breakdown of uh, Spark Max. This is how it's assembled. I don't know how many of you have ever taken one apart. Um, so we have a top case plastic, that is plastic injection molded. We've got the top level, the logic board, PCB. Um, we have a mid-level spacer, which is also injection molded. Bottom level, which is our MOSFET control board, that's the power board. And then the bottom is a uh, piece of aluminum, that's the heat sink for the device. So this is kind of how it explodes. And so you see I'm gonna highlight different manufacturing processes and then we're just gonna kind of look at some videos and I'm gonna narrate what's happening in those videos. Um, if anyone has any like super pressing questions about the manufacturing process, you can raise your hand during this. Uh, if not, we'll do questions at the end. All right, so aluminum extrusion. Uh, we use aluminum extrusion for a lot of things. It's probably one of the most cost-effective processes. Uh, I come from a background in design for manufacturing. So how many teams, so most people in the room were FRC teams. So by a show of hands, how many of you have a, a milling machine on your team, right? Okay, so you're familiar with that process. So manual milling machine, crank some handles, cut aluminum away, make it into a shape, right? So that works really great for your robot. You've got one part, right? So how many people have uh, like a CNC machine? Perfect, lots of great. So that works really great too because you can build now faster and more parts and they're more accurate, right? So, but you're building parts for one team, right? So how long would it take to mill a piece of aluminum for every team in FRC if you wanted to make one part by yourself cranking handles, right? It's not really efficient. Uh, it would take a long time, probably much longer than we have in between build seasons. So aluminum extrusion is a great process. If you've ever played with silly putty, or uh, sorry, Play-Doh, and you've kind of pushed it through a mold, imagine that. So we take molten aluminum, press it through a, a die into different shapes, and then it creates that bulk shape. Um, all the products you see up on the board are, uh, are aluminum extrusions. Some of them are very simple, and some of them are a lot more complicated. We use aluminum extrusion uh, for a lot of our parts when it's bulk forming. So even if it's take the profile of the shape, extrude that profile, and then cut it to cut it to form. So that's what we'll get into. So a couple design considerations: uh, uniform wall thicknesses. Um, you can only do a cross section, so you can't create any undercuts as part of the extrusion process. The stuff only flows in one direction. Um, rounded corners are always preferred because. If you think about Play-Doh, right, you don't want it to get caught right in that uh, in the sharp corners. Um, part symmetry plays into this, where it, you know there are there are shapes that are much better for it. So like a one by two or a one by one, very uniform parts are really great for extrusion. Things that are crazy S curves or really big parts, maybe not the right process for that. And then um, internal cavities, you can absolutely do these closed cell cavities, like we've all seen. Um, one by one, you know, the center is totally hollow, but you can't have a million little holes in there because the aluminum has to flow around and back. So jumping right into kind of the process of this, um, you essentially start with a slug of aluminum. 
and it gets sawed into billets. So a, a reasonable size. You heat the billets up to a preheat, so they're all at a, a minimum temperature. You put them into an extrusion press, basically a big auger, and then it presses the aluminum out through a process. You then stretch it, uh, you saw the extrusion to length, and then you will heat treat it. So if you've ever seen in that, heard that like 6061 T6, the T6 part is the, is the tempering process of that aluminum. And then you go from there to post, which would be anodizing, painting, or additional fabrication, CNC, packing, and transport, right? So that's all pretty fun process. I think the next slide is a video of that process. So this is, a, this is where I was a little worried about the mouse. There we go. Okay, so here's the narration. Um, intrusion press, so you'll see that's the billet coming up from underneath. That's where it's heated. Hydraulic ram pushes it through. Um, there's a, a die at the front of this, and so it just continues to put more and more pressure onto it. Um, I think I walk around here in a second. And then coming out of the die is just a really, really long strip of, that's really hard to see on the screen, but a really, really long strip of aluminum. So that normally when you extrude a shape like that, we extrude it to 40 to 60 feet long. So if you can imagine the heat sink on a Spark Max, imagine 60 feet of heat sink on a Spark Max um, as a pretty uh, interesting process. Let's see, how do I get to this? Beautiful. Okay, so now that you have that process, um, we can saw things to length. So a lot of times it's pretty simple, right? An upcut saw with a guard goes through, cuts the parts pretty simply, and then they go into a bin. Um, from there, we move on to the next step in the process, which is, um, this is fun. Okay, so then what we do is then we get to CNC machining. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll create with our factories uh, fixture plates to mount a ton of these parts so that we can move these entire fixture plates all at once. It doesn't make sense to load a singular tiny bottom of a Spark Max at one time. We mill them dozens at a time in one milling machine but it is a very intensive process to get the finished part. Um, the next thing is anodizing. So this is the bottom of a Spark Max as it's done after CNC. So you can see the bulk shape of this is this kind of cut out all the way around. You can imagine what that shape looks like as an extrusion bar and then everything that's on the inside has been CNC'd out. Um, anodizing, we, we anodize, wow, this is really sensitive. Okay, so we anodize things for a number of different reasons. Uh, some of it's because it looks good. Some of it's because it's, it protects the surface. Um, and then also anodizing has some really nice uh, heat um, transfer properties that we like for heat sinks. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna talk about is the electronics. Before I go into the electronics, even though the slideshow skipped, uh, does anyone have any questions about extrusion, anodizing, any of the first process stuff? Okay. Um, so. This is kind of the, uh, what makes a Spark Max. A Spark Max is all the electrical design. And I am not an electrical engineer. I am surrounded by them all the time. Uh, but effectively, picking components, picking individual parts, uh, different microcontrollers, different components that do things, the way that I always tell a person who's not familiar with electronic component design is it's kind of like, plumbing in some regard. You have different valves and you have different diverters and you've got different elements that do different discrete functions and then you connect them all with pipe and that's kind of how you get your circuit. That is an extremely very basic <laughs> version of it, but at a high level we do that. So we design how everything is hooked together. So that's the schematic. So that's the drawing of how it all hooks together. And then the board layout is the, this physical part is in this spot and actually how that connection line goes from one to the other. So you can see the two boards of Spark Max, the logic board and the, and the base board. And all of our boards actually have multiple layers. So they're stacked PCBs. So you end up with, you know, eight layers of traces on those boards, components on the top and the bottom, but a part can go from connection on the top to connection on the bottom using through layers. So it's a very, very cool process. I am only touching on the very high level of our assembly version, but if you, there's lots of great YouTube videos out there about how to make the actual printed circuit boards and how to do that. I recommend taking a look at some of that. Um, and then we create 
there's lots of steps, and then we end up with a printed circuit board. So you can see in this, this is just a stack of boards. There's no components, there's no chips, there's no anything. This is just how it comes ready to receive all of the parts into the next steps. Okay, so to take a finished a PCB, a printed circuit board, and to turn it into a final board, this is our, our general step. So you add solder paste, so how many people in the room have soldered? Yes, soldered, okay. So normally you think of solder as like a piece of long stringy solder and a soldering iron. So solder paste is a small pieces of solder, like little micro balls suspended in, for lack of a better way to say it, it's a flux, but like a putty, and they, you essentially melt them on together. So we add solder paste just on the pads. Um, we do pick and place, so we use robots to place our machines, place all the components. Um, we do slow pick and place for larger parts. Um, we put them in a baking oven, we're reflowing, we install through hole components, we solder all those through hole components, and then we test and program all the boards. Sounds totally easy when you do this thousands and thousands of times. But let's check out some videos. So this is, I might just sit down here so I can, I can do that. Okay, so this is the solder paste uh, application. Um, the entire process is pretty automated all together. And so what you'll see here is there's a stencil that's been laser cut out and all the little tiny holes that you'll see here in a second are all the exact little places that need solder. So every pin on every microcontroller. Um, so you can see that right there. That's a panel of all those boards getting a little tiny bit of that paste. So everywhere that touches, just like silk screening a t-shirt, is where all the parts on the boards are gonna go. You'll also notice that just like with the extrusion where we deal with more than one part at a time, this is called a panel. And so we are, we are making these eight motor controllers for every individual panel that goes through the entire system. So let's see next. Nope, same video. Okay, so this is probably my most, uh, my favorite process step. This is the pick and place. So these are robots that are picking up components from these reels of tape over on the left side. So it's all, how all the parts are done. And they're alternating, picking up the thing, throwing it over a camera, aligning the part properly, and then putting it down on the board. So that was, that process that you saw, that, that thing was basically one full panel of, of boards. This is an incredibly fast process. So, so if you think that, you know, you struggle to uh, do a traversal climb in, you know, less than 10 seconds, imagine placing 85 components in less than 30 seconds on six boards. So let's see. All right. So that's that process. And then, um, and then when you have some, this is the same video. One. So sometimes you have bigger components like uh, capacitors or like the USB parts that are just physically bigger. So you actually have to go a little bit slower to place those. So this is a secondary machine. It's doing the same thing. It peels one little part off and places it on a board. So it's a pretty interesting process. Um, I did have to, uh, I will give you a disclosure. Normally you can't take videos like this. I had to, dis we had, we disabled the safety on the door so that I could shoot these videos. Normally when you open the doors, they won't run because they're incredibly fast and um, you don't want any like dirt and contaminations in there. But I, we did this on these panels just for these videos. So, all right. All right, so now what you get is uh, time to go into the reflow oven. So now the same panels that we saw before now have all of these parts on it, the chips, the buttons, the little resistors, the capacitors, the whole thing. We load them on trays, and then we go into the, uh, the most interesting pizza oven in the world. But let's see, I think I have the video of this one next. All right. So now you can see we have multiple panels of all this different stuff. And this is a pizza oven, if you've ever, or a Quiznos bakery oven. And what this does is this is a really, really long conveyor and every single different part, and it has an entire very precisely controlled temperature zone. So as it goes through the entire process, you have to heat the solder a certain amount, let it heat up, cool it down at the right thing. But outcoming of this, this oven, which I don't actually know that this video shows the, uh, 
the end of it. But uh, basically, they just constantly go through and you heat through it. And then you once, once you're through this process, all those chips are soldered down. So the next logical question is, uh, how do you make sure that all the parts are actually in the right spot? Uh, we do an automated test or an AOI machine, and this is an optical inspection that looks at every individual part, computer vision and uh, reflectivity, and compares to master samples and things like that. So if you can imagine every single motor controller, every board going through this exact same process, it's quite, quite, quite a number of steps. Um, so now these are finished boards, and they're finished totally on the panel, which is the best part because you can you get to break those off, and now you treat them as individual boards and parts, um, to which we do test fixture and programming. We build all these custom test fixtures. Um, so if you'll notice all these little kind of brass pins, those are all called pogo pins, and so they come down and they touch little parts on the board, and we program it, put code on it, we activate, we test all the circuits, we make sure that everything is fully, fully functional before it even gets assembled into a motor controller. So if there's ever an issue, we catch it at this stage so it doesn't end up on your robot. So that was kind of the, the printed circuit board at a very high level. Um, the next one here is actually on the uh, top case plastic. This is the process that I get, I think, mo the most amount of questions about overall, which is injection molding. Um, most things that are made out of plastic, well, hold on, before I go, go forward in injection molding, any questions about circuit boards, making PCBs, anything like that? Yeah? Are you doing 100% testing on those, or is that 100% testing. So with every one of our critical, with critical rev components, which would be motor controllers, control hubs, expansion hubs, um, even things like through bore sensors and, and all that stuff, it's 100% test on a, every single board that goes through. And it's actually a double check because there's a, like, a board only test and then there is also a finished product test. So, uh, and we do catch problems, right? Like we, you know, normally manufacturing somewhere in the three to 5% range of issues when you go through it, but we all catch it during these tests. Those can get reworked or repaired and then get re back into the system. So our fallout for bad product is actually really low. We, so we do use BGAs on some products, not on these. Uh, we do x-ray when we need to. Um, one of the things that Rev does is we're not as constrained as some, men, some product development companies on trying to make it smaller, lighter, fit in your pocket, squeeze into this little, this spot. And so as a result, we try to lean towards using more standard package sizes because it's a little easier to work with, your fallout's a little bit less, they tend to be, in some cases, cheaper and more accessible, and it leads to a little bit of a bigger product, but uh, BGAs, they are in some of our products, they're just uh, not in this one. So, uh, for, sorry, for those who don't know that, um, their different circuit chips have different um, connection types of the actual uh, like parts on the board. Normally, you, you think of a circuit chip with the legs coming out from the sides, and there can be you know, 10, 10 pins, 5 pins, 64 pins, but at some point, you run out of perimeter space on the chip. So a BGA um, is basically tiny balls on the bottom of the chip, so you're actually using the flat surface area of the bottom of the chip to make all the connections. If you've ever done anything with like a computer or put a motherboard chip onto a computer and you see like all those pins on the bottom, think of those pins as soldered to balls, but in some cases the pins are not there, you just solder that, that straight down to the board. So it's a little more space efficient, but finding a problem with a chip, if it's soldered wrong with a pin that comes out the side, you can touch it with a soldering iron or do a little bit of rework. If the BGA doesn't solder and it's in the middle you have to use x-ray to figure out what's going on and then the reworking of it is a lot more challenging. But the space savings for things like your phones and Apple watches and things like that is, is worth it. Any other electronic stuff before we go? All right, injection molding. Um, um, so injection molding is, how many people are familiar with 3D printing? Perfect. So how long does it take to 3D print a a part, like a 
three hours, right? Three hours, 10 hours, 24 hours, because for um, FDM printing, which is what most of you are familiar with, you're kind of just going layer by layer, putting plastic down. Injection molding is the other side of that. Almost everything plastic that you encounter in the world, most things are 3D, pr are, um, are injection molded. So it's really fast and it's really cost effective for on the per part cost. The challenge is that to make the mold, it is very expensive to make the mold. The molds are made out of steel. They take a very long time to produce because you're cutting hardened steel. Um, and so, and then modification of the part after it's been built is a little bit challenging. So there's always kind of a balancing act between when is the right time to do injection molding because there are other processes. Like you can CNC parts at scale out of plastic or you can uh, resin cast or do a lot of other processes, but injection molding is still the king of making high volume plastic parts. And we, Rev does a lot of it. All right, let's see, let me click. Okay, so number one rule of injection molding, make sure the design is final before you hit go on the injection mold. I can't say that enough. Um, I will say that over the course of the last eight years of Rev, uh, we have made some, maybe we jumped the gun on pulling the mold a little bit too soon and you can end up scrapping thousands and thousands of dollars of molds because you just can't fix them or what you thought you were doing is just not gonna work. So please make sure you've got the right thing before you're done, um, before you go there. Um, wow, I went over the slide, so this is gonna be interesting. All right, so I'm gonna remember how that started, how that slide worked. There's a little arrow down there. I apologize, I normally have a clicker and I, let's see. Okay, perfect. So, um, so the first one is design for manufacturing. Um, 3D printing has actually been a really interesting uh, thing because in 3D printing, with support material, you can print lots and lots of designs that are impossible to injection mold. With injection molding, minding a few different options and more advanced stuff, you really need to be able to open the mold around it. So anything that's an undercut um, or something from the side is a little bit of a challenge because you actually have to get that out of the mold. So this is a design for manufacturing um, example from the original Spark. So we release it to production, we go through iterations, we talk about modifying holes, you know, when you're trying to interface a board to a piece of plastic, there's a lot of questions of like, how, how much clearance do you need, how much tolerance? So there's an entire process to injection molding. Again, there's some awesome videos on design for injection molding. Uh, for those of you who are thinking about going into mechanical engineering on the design side of it, injection molding is something that many, many, many industries engage with. So it's something to kind of keep in mind. All right. I actually know how I went back with that just a second ago. All right, so, so mold design. So this is a cross-sectional view of what an injection mold looks like. It's a big chunk of steel. Um, and over on the, well, let's start over here. So in the middle, you can see the, the kind of the, the original spark sitting in the middle of all these tubes and pipes. And so we are pushing molten plastic into that part. So imagine a cavity and then that cavity is just filled with molten plastic and then the mold opens and ejects the part. So the, you end up with two blocks of steel, which are the insert, the, the teal and the, I'm just gonna walk. So <laughs> the lower part and the, and the top part kind of come together and there's part of the top, part of the bottom in that part. All the other tubes that you see around it are, are one of three things. So these molds have cooling in them because you need to be able to control the temperature. So how do you eject a molten piece of plastic? Well, you cool it down. So there's water lines and cooling lines so it spits the molten plastic in and then it rapidly cools the mold so that you can eject it. There are also springs and hydraulics that hold this, this, these molds together. Sometimes they're integrated as part of the mold and sometimes they are external, but a lot of times the springs are part of it. And then the other times are 
on the, you can put water in to cool things down, but you can also put heating elements in to heat things up, right? So there's some heating elements here, but this is a kind of a good look at what a generic mold looks like on the inside. And as you can tell, it's a little bit complicated to make this. So that's probably the biggest challenge with injection molding is actually making it. Um, we don't design the molds ourselves in-house at Rev. We work with partners, but we have full approval that we have to review all the mold designs because where you place, where the plastic gets injected and where things, it really affects the finished, the finished product and how it looks uh, cosmetically, but also functionally for things like molded gears and pulleys. You really wanna make sure that drafts are going in the right direction. The plastic, you're not seeing like little marks on the plastic where you need a functional part. Um, molds are made in machine shops. So this is a, a small mold house um, that we use for some of our stuff. They have CNC machines, but these giant blocks of steel that you see in the foreground, those are molds. You need some of our bigger parts. You need overhead cranes to move these molds around, even though you're making a small little tiny piece of plastic. Um, again, here's some examples of what the molds look like uh, when they're fully assembled. And so let's talk about how they make these. So there are a lot of molds where you just ultimately CNC the negative of the part that you make. Uh, that is absolutely a process. But for really tight, precise details, a lot of times you use this process called uh, EDM or RAM EDM, which uses a little custom-made uh, copper um, that's got electricity flowing through it and essentially it just touches it and it arcs to the part that you're going to and every tiny arc removes a tiny, tiny little bit of metal from it, but you end up with an extremely precise cavity. It just takes forever, right? So if you have ever, uh, has anybody here done any welding? A little bit, okay. So if you ever do a little bit of welding and you like, you zap an arc from your welder to the material and it makes a little divot, Think of the micro version of that to do holes and cavities on the inside. Um, so there's a lot of things there. Um, so this is what uh, this is the mold for Spark Max. Uh, you can see all the little cavities. Just like also we don't process them individually. So same thing like the board. Same thing like the extrusion. Everything is about how many of these can you make at one time. You'll actually notice on this one, we, you know, we have two plastic parts inside of a, of a Spark Max. We have the top case that everybody sees, and we have a spacer on the middle. So the middle is the four cavities for the top case, and then the outside four are the spacer that you don't see unless you take the, the Spark Max apart. Um, the plastic flows in through this center hole here, and then you see these channels that look like they're cut. Uh, this is actually before it was completed but the plastic will flow in and then flow in and fill each one of the cavities kind of this direction. And let's keep going here. Um, one of the things I talked about was not the, having the ability to have an undercut on the piece of plastic. Um, this has a, our Spark Max has a thing called a slide or a gate. So these move in and out. That's how we make the USB holes on the side of the, of the actual plastic and that's an extra hydraulic action in when they're being molded. Uh, so let's look at what molding looks like. I'm sorry the screen is so dim, but effectively the mold closes around it. It takes about 30 seconds per shot, and then you'll see the little parts pop out from the thing, and then it just goes again. So the average cycle time of a small part like a Spark Max is about 30 seconds. So that means when we're producing these, we get four Spark Max cases every 30 seconds as we're producing them. So this is all about designing for mass production. This is also relatively small as compared to a, a toy or a thing that you might see at Walmart or because there is, you know, we're not producing millions upon millions of Spark Maxes. These molds have four cavities. There are molds that have eight, 10, 12, 16, and then people mold I've got dozens of the same mold just producing products. I mean, when you ship, when you look at the iPhone, a plastic part inside the iPhone where they ship 22 million units, 30 seconds divided by how many shots, you need a lot of capacity to build at a high scale. But it's definitely faster than milling them individually by turning hand cranks. Um, so a couple things. Uh, this, again, it's, there are things you can change about a mold and things you can't. 
once you mold things and you start fitting things together, you will see interferences like, oh, these solder blobs are too tall or they moved or they're in the wrong spot or this part hits this rib and you can go back and make small modifications. But when you do injection molding, it's really hard to take like this hole here and be like, ah, I wanna move that one over here, right? It's really easy to say, well, this little tiny rib isn't tall enough, so we need to make this rib a little bit taller. So again, the closer you are to the final design, the better it is for injection molding. And then here's where we bring it all together. Um, total steps of final assembly process. We have the anodized and aluminum CNC part from the first steps. We add the um, thermal pads and isolation pads on the bottom. We install the lower MOSFET board. That's where all the power circuit is. We have the spacer that we get screwed in. We put the top logic board on and then we cover it and it becomes a, a motor controller. Um, some closing thoughts. I have some other videos, but I wanted to leave some time for this. Um, wow, again. Um, okay, closing thoughts. Um, designing hardware is hard, but it's really rewarding. Uh, I will say that one of the most rewarding things in my life is that being able to walk the pits and see things that I have designed and started from nothing. They never existed and seeing them there out there in the wild. Um, that is in double down when you think about the impact that FIRST has and the organization has on the things that we work on every single day. But that is an incredibly rewarding experience. And I think many of you probably share it on a smaller scale for the part that you catted, went to the machine, cut, and then now you have that physically in your hand. That's pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> with mass production, uh, one thing that goes wrong can derail the entire process. Uh, currently, our biggest challenge in making products is actually the supply chain as a whole globally is completely messed up right now. Uh, we components or the electrical parts that are inside Spark Maxes and new control system and things, normally those were you know, two or three months planning ahead and you can get whatever part you need. Uh, now, we, those parts might be a year or a year and a half away after the time we order them. So we are way further ahead trying to think about planning because there's no surplus of this stuff. Um, I know many teams from Michigan know, and maybe you've heard, there's lots of car manufacturers that just have hundreds of thousands of cars sitting in parking lots waiting for boards to arrive because that has derailed the whole process. Um, even the best laid plans can go wrong. Uh, we always leave extra time so we want to be able to iterate and fix it and do things. So that's, that's kind of a life thing. It will always take longer than you expect. Um, and then lastly, these are kind of some higher level philosophies in product design. Um, when you design a product, it will not be everything to everyone, right? So a great example is you, you walk the pits and there's lots of teams using Spark Max and Neo, but there's also lots of teams running Falcons or running Sims or running 775s or running things. We cannot be everything to everyone. So it is really important to define your specifications, what your goal is, and design the product that you have set out to design. If you try to go so wide and try to establish and find every single person's needs across the board, you'll never get done with a product. Um, there's, there can always be a version two where you add things that you miss. Hopefully you can fix some things in code, but in general, you cannot be everything to everyone. Um, failing faster is better than slow success. So I would much rather design a board, blow it up in a couple weeks than spend six months staring at a screen designing a board to try to get it to the perfect point because I know it's gonna fail anyway. So if you just accept the fact that everything is gonna fail, I would much rather fail faster than be perfect a long time from now. Um, understanding who your customers are, for in, in our case, it's, it's you all out there, it's teams, it's the people who are using a product. That is more important than the physical product yourself. You can design something that you think is super cool, but if you don't understand who your customer is, that is a really big problem. And then working carefully towards a defined goal. I mean, just like your robot is gonna be more successful if on kickoff day you have a strategy and you're building towards that strategy, um, you're gonna be much better off than just starting to throw parts together uh, at the end of it. So I hope that gave you a little bit of insight in some product development, maybe some product manufacturing uh, options and things that you might not have been aware of. Um, I'm around for questions if anybody has questions and 
If not, that's kind of the presentation that I've got. So. So are there any questions? I think entry, so the question is about entry level CNC machines. I think it really depends on what you're trying to do, right? So I know that a lot of FRC teams are really partial to, there's a, a, a CNC router called an Omeo, which is really great at cutting like flat plates and, and like, you know, sheet material, because it's a router. If you're trying to do more three dimensional cuts, complicated things, there's not a lot in the really, really low cost range. I'd say uh, Tormach makes a really good machine, but they're not like, they're not $200,000 CNC machines, but they're still like $30,000 CNC machines. I know that Haas has some low end, lower end machines, but besides those big ones, it's a really challenging kind of niche to fill on a low cost CNC machine because in an industrial shop, when you're building something at any sort of scale, you want the biggest, the bestest, the fastest to go, and that's what that's what most of the machine companies are doing. So I'm sure there might be some educational stuff out there, but I would look at Tormach, and I'd probably look at some of the Haas offerings in the like in the mid, you know, thirty and forty thousand dollar price range. If I was trying to equip a shop. So, yeah, so, okay, so the question is about where do our product specs come from, and I, I, I guess I didn't actually cover that too much at the beginning, but it depends on what the product is. So on some products like uh, control system products for, um, for FRC or FTC, first will provide us like a minimum requirements. They need to have this, deal with this current, like this, these type of framework products. First doesn't say, oh, you have to put a voltage display on your power distribution hub, right? Um, or you have to specifically use this connector, or you have to use this. Um, a lot of that is internal to our team. We do a lot of brainstorming and refinement. Uh, we build a lot of test boards, like an unbelievable amount of prototype test boards to learn specific things, not full featured products, but an example is the new power distribution board ha uh, has, um, you know, latching Wago connectors. While we were doing a connector search for that, we built tons of boards with tons and tons of different connectors and we ran experiments on how good are they? How many times can you latch them? What's the force it takes to break them? We let people play with them and we do that. So we know like on a customer centric perspective, when we're doing research about a new product, we say, okay, what is the current state of the robotics market? And we say, okay, well, here are points of failure, so let's address these points of failure. And then once we know and have the problem state and what we're trying to solve, then we start having the brainstorm of feature sets that might live within that problem statement, break them into must-haves, nice-to-haves, stretch goal type of things, develop our specification documents, and then that's where we go into prototyping iteration to learn what we don't know. I mean, we are not experts in connectors, but, and there's a ton of manufacturers of connectors, so we need to test and see what's gonna work for what we're doing. So the ultimate answer is it's a little bit of um, teams come to us with problems, we feed that in, but ultimately we try to establish a high level problem statement. And then from that problem statement, we do internal iteration, and then we use uh, external feedback against our product specifications before we pull the trigger on a design. But a lot of it's internally generated with external feedback. Any other questions? Do you, do you want to see some bonus videos? Okay, I, I don't wanna take your time. I know this is the world championship and I appreciate you sh sharing an hour with me, but I, I do, I have some bonus videos if you wanna see them. Um, so the first bonus video I have is uh, winding brushless motors. So uh, this is what it's like to actually make a Neo. So. Um, you'll see not both rigs are running at the same time, but this is the general process of every single coil of every single Neo. So that's uh, magnetic winding wire, and it 
robotically wraps every single coil this exact same way. Pretty cool. Um, you'll notice that it changes directions. So part of brushless motors, because you have three phase of magnetics, there's actually three individual, three individual unconnected coils. That's the three wires that are coming out of it. And the direction that they are wrapped is actually important to the function of the motor and then which one of them they're actually around. So that's a uh, pretty fun process. But that's, so that's, that's a brushless winding machine. Um, let's see. Uh, this is one of my favorite processes. Uh, this is a process called sintering. Um, it's a powdered metal process. So you take tiny little powdered metal and you use a hydraulic ram to press it together, kind of like forming wet sand into a sand castle. And then you take that and you bake it. Um, this is actually being used for making gears that we use in our ultraplanetary uh, gearboxes. But you can see every single time that ram actually comes down, it's compressing. And that's one gear every single time it comes down. So the secondary process of this is that these go into a, a long oven, very similar to the reflow oven, and they, they effectively micro weld into a, into a part. So that's a pretty fun process. Um, let's see. Um, this is a, a, a gear cutting. So on the other side of gears, um, if for bevel gears, this is actually cutting, you know, bevel gear process. So um, not sometimes, sometimes we do things where we make an investment in tooling, like injection molding or sintering. Those are mold related processes. And sometimes we full CNC individual parts and it all depends on the volume. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um, uh, this is uh, pressing pins into uh, like planetary carrier plates. This is not actually our planetary carrier plate, but it is a very similar process to kind of how we, we do this. But uh, wh when you think about products and the ones that you inter interface that are from Rev or from other manufacturers, it is easy to forget, but is there's still a very big, you know, a lot of steps to make any individual product here. So, all right. So I'm getting the lights. That means we're. Uh... Oh, okay. Well, that that would have been good, 45 minutes ago. But I'll go. <laughs> it's okay. That's okay. Um, let me. Since we have the lights down, while you guys are kind of packing up, let me back up. Okay. One more minute. I'm just gonna go back to a couple uh, of the other videos. Maybe you didn't see like this one and play these again so you can kind of take a look. Yep. So anyway, there, there's a lot of steps. I do appreciate you spending time with me. If you have any questions, I will hang around that way a little bit. But uh, I hope you guys have a great championship.